Hello and welcome to Victory Points. I'm Becca Scott. And I'm Jake Michaels. This is a podcast about people who love tabletop games. Interviewing other people who love tabletop games about the tabletop games they love. This week our guest is Vince Casso. An actor, writer, best known for his co-starring role as Blades with two Zs on the critically acclaimed web series The Guild. I am British Australian. I'm really sorry for all the <laughs> people I've really offended. You're really mixing it. Well, maybe you um, both It's the countries. best I can do. I used to have a pretty okay English accent, and then I got better at my Australian accent. I was and now say, it's just one. Australian's difficult, and you nailed it. Oh. Kind of. Every oh, few seconds. Thank you. <laughs> Every third word was flawless. Okay, well, let me finish finish the introduction for Vince uh, in my Australian accent. He plays Greg on Vampire the Masquerade, oh, LA by Night. Story. We're a live frontier. He's also on. And he's Kaylin Bellevue in Jake's D&D campaign, <laughs> Scales and Tales. Welcome, You can't ben. find it anywhere unless you are a fly on the wall in the room. It's not. Recorded. But you can come down to Burbank and check it out. Can they? Yeah, yeah. come to my house and sit in Vince's, on the game. Vince's yeah. kitchen table. Absolutely. Vince, hi. Hi. <laughs> welcome. Welcome to Victory Points. Oh, good to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah. And that is the first time uh, I've done the intro in my really good accent work. Congratulations. I, I was, yeah, I was transported. Vince, you're an actor. How are you with accents? <laughs> oh, boy. I'm not I'm asking a- you to do any, and I apologize to everyone that I did that. I'm okay. <laughs> You apologize to everyone. Everyone, especially. I've had to practice a great many because I do voice work. Uh, so it's it's nice to ha- have some as an option. But I typically find myself if I'm cast or auditioning for a specific role like that, having to brush up like right before, because I do you lose it if you're not using it constantly. How do you brush up? Is there a specific coach that you have tapes by, or do you just go to YouTube? <laughs> I go to YouTube. Yeah, I, yeah. I find clips of well, there's two things for impressions and accents. Both now that we're on this topic. Uh, it's great to find native speakers, but sometimes the people who can help you learn the most of the nuance are people who themselves are not native speakers, but are very good at doing the accent. Mm -hmm. Because they will sort of emphasize and accentuate those points specific to the accent that you can then pick up on. Sometimes native speakers are too, like, they're too good at it. It's too nuanced. It's too natural for them. Just because you can do something well doesn't mean you could teach it well. Yeah, Mm. it's true. All right, well, we should talk about what we're going to talk about on this (laughs) podcast about (laughs) tabletop games. This is the accent show. (laughs) Uh, We're going to dig into an old favorite genre that everybody loves, social deception games, hidden role games. We're also going to talk about ways in which to keep your cool in a PvP game, player versus player, a one-on-one game, and uh, how to leave the game without animosity. Mm-hmm. And, okay, you you guys can help advise me on this because it's not something I'm good at. <laughs> uh, and then how becoming tabletop gamers has positively affected the way that we interact with other people. Ooh, yeah. yeah. Which I think is a beautiful thing. We talk a lot about the beautiful benefits of being a tabletop gamer. It's kind of our brand. It's kind of the thing, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's real good because that's victory points for life. That's life victory, you know? I'd say. Yeah, that's how one wins. All right, but first, <laughs> Vince, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, Kaylin Bellevue. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's start there. Yeah, let's start there. I, so, first of all, I've never received a credit for <laughs> first one. For, for a my private D&D, D&D home game. game. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, wow, yeah, so uh, Jake actually, so I actually had never played D&D <gasps> until like the tail end of last year. Cool. And I got in touch with a lot of people, posted up on Facebook, and ultimately started talking with Jake Oh, that's about, how that started, huh? It was just a Facebook post. Yeah. I forgot about that. Yeah, and then because Jake mentioned wanting to, or being open to run a game, mm-hmm. and we realized there's actually a lot of people who work in and around Geek and Sundry who've either never played or had hardly played much at all D&D. And so myself, TJ Rotel, uh, Denise Pentoha, initially it was my, myself and TJ, but we pulled uh, them, Liz Cooner, a bunch of others, uh, ultimately into this whole sort of uh, crazy party we Sean had going. Hudson. Sean Hudson. And uh, we created Scales and Tails, named because all of us are wacky beast race, like uh, <laughs> uh, what have you. We got two tieflings, we have a tabaxi, we have a dragonborn, uh, Sean's a half orc. So it's just like it's He's a. He's got it's some a, scales. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, Scales and Tails and Mongo. Uh, it's, a, it's a motley crew of of silly folks. And yes, uh, my character in that game is Kalen Belfew. Who has an accent. Who has an accent. He does Uh-oh. have what would a you define posh that accent? English. Posh it's English. called received pronunciation. Are we? Ooh. Yeah. 
if you were posh, would it sound like this? I have so to say it, hit that. That's a little bit like, London right there. Mm. Yeah. So received like. pronunciation is more like what you know Hermione Granger speaks in like uh, Harry Potter, uh, where it's not you don't have that London sort of act, uh, lilt ah. to it. It's more just a very clean. Our understanding of like a traditional, like normal British accent is received pronunciation. Sure, mm. but yeah. nobody talks like that. Nobody talks classy. like that. No, <laughs> just D and D characters. I just D and D characters. <laughs> yeah, uh, and yes, that's fun. And uh, yeah, it's been a fun game to play. It, it was my first real introduction to D and D, and we've been running that game now pretty consistently for like almost a, almost a year. Like we're coming it in. Has been once we hit like the fall, it'll be about a year. That's we've crazy. Been playing that game. Yeah. yeah. Oh boy. So. That's been that's been your crash course of well not really a years a long time but what have you taken away th- that has made you that you've been able to transfer to other aspects of your life from this game Honestly the thing that I learned the most from playing D&D and from doing streaming in general whether it's LA by Night or Frontier or what have you is that you are forced to really pull out the improv chops mm. hardcore. I mean, obviously, the storytelling aspect, the character aspect of the games is entirely based upon improv. Um, dramatic comedy or otherwise, it's making stuff up on the spot. And I've done a lot of improv in my life, but I've never been forced to just, like, to hold a scene for what is effectively is a three-hour scene, <laughs> more or less. Yeah. Um, and that's never something that I've had to do before. And initially... When I first got cast on Frontier, for example, because that was the first real RPG I ever played was Outbreak Undead oh. for We're Alive Frontier. Hmm. I had never done it before. Tabletop RPG. You Tabletop played video RPG. games and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Sure. Um, but like, you know, that that improv-based storytelling I've never done before until that game. I was freaking terrified. <laughs> oh, really? Already, improv has always made me nervous. Like, yeah. it always tends to go pretty well, but I still get scared of doing it. Sure. Um... But it wasn't until playing through a season, part of a season, of, <laughs> well <laughs> of that, said, well said, of that uh, game, of that show, um, and then going on to do Elliot by Night, to do D and D, that I became very comfortable just kind of riffing off the cuff, and it was that more so than the years of classes that I did, honestly, that made me comfortable as an improv artist because. There's, there's no pressure. You're not, like, forced to do a scene for an audience who has to laugh at it. Yeah. It's more for yourself, and it's for fun. And honestly, that, for in my mind, just, like, psychologically destigmatized the idea of improv storytelling. It's so interesting you say there's no pressure because you, it's, you have been role-playing under one of the most harsh pressure environments, I think, which is in front of a live audience. I mean, not a live audience, but a, a, a live yeah. internet audience. But, like, I, I, I get what you're saying in that, like, it's different from classes because classes are a learning environment. Yeah, where you're absolutely. Just really focused on learning, whereas the game is the fun environment, and you're learning yeah. through fun, right? Which is the best way to learn. And, and the I, feedback is not from an audience. Well, I mean, in an improv setting, when you go do a little indie show, yeah, it's very possible and inevitable that you will bomb many times. Oh yeah. <laughs> but in a tabletop role playing show, you're not focused on getting the laughs. Right. You're focused on holding up story and holding up your fellow castmates. Yeah. And so with that easy focus, without the distraction of needing to perform, is that is that kind of what makes it a little destigmatized? It's weird. It's a hybrid thing for me because it's actually that the pressure you mentioned mm-hmm. of of Jake of having to uh perform for the audience you can't see actually for me helps. Uh, because I enjoy the aspect and I am comforted by the aspect that we are putting on a show. To the degree that almost I'm more comfortable doing an RPG, playing an RPG on camera, than I am at a home game. Mm-hmm. Because it's like, I, I my background is as an actor. I am a performer. And so when I know I have to perform, I'm almost more comfortable in that environment than being at a home game where like, well, I could do anything right now. Shit, there's too many options. Mm. It's overwhelming. But, you know, if I'm playing Greg on Alley by Night... Jason pulls me aside and say, look, this is the angle we want to take on this episode. Here's where this scene should go and just go. I'm like, perfect. I have a structure, but now I can live and breathe and move how I want to within that constraint. And it's a perfect balance for me. Yeah. I think you're an outlier in that way, in a very good way, because so many people would be intimidated by that. But you like embrace it. And that's what actors do. Yeah. They thrive in that environment. Absolutely. Well, let's talk a little bit more about Vampire the Masquerade, L.A. by Night, which I want to introduce for people who maybe aren't familiar with these role-playing games that 
our on Geek and Sundry mm-hmm. uh, that Vince has been in that I am sort of a tangential NPC come to life in LA right, by Night yeah. as well. Uh, Chloe. <laughs> and, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And now Archangel. You. you did. Yeah. Uh, no, you captured me. But um, <laughs> yes. Same thing. <laughs> Reverse capture. <Yeah. laughs> so Vampire the Masquerade is put out by White Wolf. It's Vampire has been around forever it's as an old RPG. School game. Yeah, it's oh, super yeah. old school. And White Wolf and Jason Carl have been writing this new iteration of the game and then brought it to Geek and Sundry and it's just blown up. I mean, hashtag family is yeah. <laughs> so full of beautiful art yeah. and people are so involved in watching this show and what they've done is pulled in other people like us from Geek and Sundry's circles to play these NPCs and what's interesting yeah. is that Jason Carl has taken this approach of just not Okay, I'm going to present my story. I've been planning as the the game master and not going to tell. But it is a little bit more shaped mm-hmm. as a story, with still completely improvised within that yeah. as far as dialogue goes. But there is a little bit more structure there, which I think is really interesting. So, what is your tell us who Greg is in the world and what your experience has been? Yeah, so uh, Gregory Dimitrios, codenamed Daffodil, uh, <laughs> is a yeah. That was that was uh, Cynthia's idea. <laughs> um, is uh, he's basically an ex FBI agent who was working for a special division of the FBI called the Special Affairs Division, and they are basically the X Files oh, guys. Sad, mm-hmm. the sad. Yeah, oh. <laughs> I know it's a bummer. Uh, they're basically the X Files guys in the sense that in this world, uh, many law enforcement and government agencies know to some degree that su- certain supernatural things exist. But it's not really taken very seriously. So literally, my division in the FBI was like three people. Uh, and we were grossly underfunded and mostly did our various operations on our own efforts. Like we had an idea to go somewhere and then went and checked things out there. A quick uh, shout out to <clears throat> Karen Murphy and the Special Investigations Unit of the Chicago Police Department, which is a character from the Dresden Files. Uh, similar well, there you department. Go. Shout out. Shout, shout out. out to Karen. You've been Sponsor shouted. of the show. Thank you, Karen. <laughs> She's a fictional character. Anyway, sorry. Well, the money uh, was real. But yeah, but yeah. So it's an underfunded department throughout yes. all media. Yeah. And so Greg, uh, with his team, came out to L.A. in search of these vampires, what, what what they call blank bodies, because they don't show up on any like scans, imaging, thermal. They never yeah. appear on machinery. You can't see them. Uh, so they're derisively called blank bodies. Uh, and uh, through various events, uh, his team is killed off essentially, with Greg being the only one left. He then is forced to confront one of the vampires, uh, Nellie G, played by Cynthia Marie, the, the wonderful Cynthia Marie, uh, for help, essentially, because he's out in the street, he's got no funding, he's got no resources, uh, the vampires are hunting him now, because they're, they're beginning to get on the trail of the fact that there's one surviving FBI member left here in town, and so she agrees to cover for him as long as he works for her as a ghoul. And the story Dif- from that point. What's a ghoul in so that a ghoul, world? Yeah, a ghoul in Vampire the Masquerade is essentially more or less a thrall for a vampire. Now, fundamentally <laughs> in the lore, uh, they are just people who are consuming on some regular interval vampire blood. It uh, makes vitae. you super powerful. Makes yes, you... makes you stronger. But you only gain temporarily. Some of the abilities. It's temporary. Yeah, it's honestly just like it's a, a little like in a your drug. coffee every morning, or like what do you just mean? Just a drop. Yeah. Just okay. a splash. So yeah, the, basically we have to re up every. I mean, it's like a monthly thing usually. Um, but uh, it conveys that power, and you stop aging. So there are ghouls, for example, nice. uh, uh, Eve, played by Nora Ibrahim, who ha- has been a ghoul for like over a hundred years. The problem is if you stop consuming the blood, age catches up to you and you die. Rapidly. Very rapidly cool. once you're, once you're off the cool. blood. Yeah. Um, what it does also is if you continually get the blood from the same vampire, you end up developing what's called a blood bond, where you are beholden to their whims. You are agreeable to them. You do things they want you to do, even without being fully conscious of the fact that you're under that kind of spell. And so... <clears throat> The number of blood doses that Greg has had so far is not currently public knowledge. That has not been disclosed yet in the series. But the fact of how much of what he's been doing lately is because of a possible blood bind versus what he himself would choose to do is part of the conflict that we're exploring in the story. No one knows where the... Where the interests are coming from. Yeah, no one knows exactly what his motivations are, especially with the way... Do we know whose ghoul he is? 
Yeah, he's Nellie's. Yep. Yeah, because we, we saw that whole scene take place in season one, uh, in the uh, epilogues of season one. And uh, especially with the way the uh, storyline is going in this season with some other anti-vampire players coming to the table, we see Greg playing a game of appearing to play for multiple sides. Mm. And the viewers are not quite sure exactly who he actually has loyalty for. So we'll be exploring that. And in fact, you might see a little bit of Greg this week if you tune in. On Friday? On Friday. Is that... Uh I want to say, oh, what time? Pacific. I have no idea. <laughs> we'll say, it, we'll say 8 p.m. 8 p.m. 8 p.m. 8 p.m. <laughs> I asked. You go up at 8. Okay, well, regardless, okay, when this Pacific. airs, though, so it'll be two oh, weeks yeah, from now. Oh, yeah, no. Well, they'll find it on the internet. There you go. This will have already on, happened. It, yeah, yeah, it'll be on the Twitch. How is the future, guys? Three? What's it like two weeks from now? Yeah, hello from the past. Hello uh, from the past. Well, they can't say anything, but I hope you're all answering aloud in your cars or wherever you are. Tell us what it's like. Now, you are a person that thoroughly commits to creating a backstory oh for God, any yeah. character. Tell us what that process this is guy like. Knows. Why you do that, <laughs> and and why you think that 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 is a good approach. If anyone <clears throat> is wanting to know how to dig more into a backstory before yeah. they start a new character. So there are definitely multiple different schools of thought, and they're all perfectly valid. Uh, <laughs> so I'm fundamentally a storyteller, which is why I'm also now starting my own D and D campaign as well as DM. Um, and so Jake can attest to this. When I started developing Kaylin as a character, I mean, I sent you reams of backstory. Mm -hmm. And then together we developed so much more as well, mm -hmm. collaboratively. Uh, <clears throat> and yet I've also played with people and have players in my own game who are like, their backstory is one paragraph describing their character. And they're like, just make up the rest. Like, I don't care. I'm like, okay, great. Because I will do it. Yes. Um, so yeah, for me, having a fully a fully fledged, fully fleshed out person helps me both to actually convey the character, play the role, and also to insert myself in the world. Because anyone who is a member of this world, who has is playing in this campaign, whatever the campaign may be, uh, they've obviously lived in this world their whole life. And so they've interfaced with all the different types of things that you may encounter in that world. And so I like to tie myself in to the greater world, even if those tie-ins never come up in the story, they should still exist. And as a DM, I also want to take all the characters who are coming to my table and say, like, great, even if you don't know how this happened, I'm going to work you into the world and plot so that random things that have to do with you might come up during the story. Things you were not even necessarily aware of. Um, so for me, yeah, that's a vital part of being able to hold and portray a character and feel like I'm actually in this world playing this person realistically. I yeah, I imagine that would really help decision making because yeah. uh, in my days performing improv, w one of the best pieces of advice I ever got is be able to say this character's point of view, their worldview in a sentence. So they see everything as horrible. It's so simple. But if, if that's you always know how to respond if you've given yourself these parameters to work in and, oh, well, if I see an orc, I, I know my past experience with orcs, so uh, I know how I what my natural predisposition towards this character will be. And not yeah. that it might not change and evolve because you've created something three-dimensional, but you have a place to start and you always know when you've done that work what the, your instinctual response is. Absolutely, yeah. So do you create different uh, categories and go, okay, here's their childhood, here's their likes and dislikes, or where, or do you do <clears> just <throat> sort of freeform write? Well, so what I do is generally, I will try and tell the full story of the character from childhood forward to present day. All the things they've been through, all of them, <laughs> <laughs> And also all of these sort of ancillary NPCs, locations, and uh, what have you that they've interfaced with across their life. Now, and I've found that in doing so, just as a natural consequence, you will end up understanding their dispositions and attitudes. Because they went through this over here with these people, they have a natural inclination toward blank. You can just sort of feel it at that point. I don't feel the need to get too academic about it and be like, well... Confronted with these situations, they do this, if this, then this, if this, then this. Your backstory kind of answers the personality trait questions for you, yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Instead of you having to pick from the table, you're like, well, this happened, therefore he is this way. Yeah. Sure. Well, because that's also how people are. 
Like mm-hmm. your the, your dispositions toward life and toward people are the result of your experiences, and not like mm. you sitting down one day and being like, okay, let me ponder over every possible thing that could happen to me and how I choose to <laughs> respond to it. No, you've been through things, and so you respond to things a certain way. I feel like you also are just a person that just loves to sit down and write that backstory. I really like, do. I can see you really sitting do. at your table smiling, writing. <laughs> no, for, for sure. real. Okay, yeah. so. Mm, for real, um, with the campaign that I'm about to start DMing, we have our first game scheduled on July 28th. Super psyched. Been trying to plan that shit for three months. Congrats. Uh, hashtag that's, you know, d and Adulthood, life. yeah. 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 Um, but uh, with that game, I sat down and I homebrewed the whole world. I drew the map. Wow. Uh, I'm writing it as a module to be published as well. At um, your first time DMing. Yeah, oh yeah. I, Brilliant. This is, I, 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 I have yeah, to. Go for yeah, it. You yeah, you go all in. <clears throat> and so I've got a stack of papers. I, you know, I've written books in the world. I've written every possible bit of lore you can imagine. I have a stack of paper on my desk, and this is just what I haven't gotten into a typed form yet. It's all handwritten. And it's about this tall. My fingers are about three inches off from each other, what? if you can't see. <laughs> um, of just not only lore for the world, but books written by NPCs in the world, their life stories, the backstories of each of the characters, the players at the table, that they aren't aware of. Things that have happened around them throughout their upbringing that will then inform their later story. Um, All of the religious traditions of every city, every culture, which each culture came from, the prehistory, everything that I can possibly think of. And it's true because for me, as you were saying, that's just the escape. That's the part that I enjoy. I'll just sit back on my couch, pop on YouTube, and just be writing yeah. for three hours. Yeah. I just love that part. It's fun. I would love to check back one year from now and see like what's happened since then and like what changed in your story based on the character's choices. Yeah. An entire Rocks compendium. Fall, everyone dies. <laughs> oh, God. Entire compendium in six point font. All right. We have to take a quick break, yeah. but I it, my mind is blown. We have so much more to ask you about. Uh, the games that you enjoy playing in the tabletop world, as well as I want to know more about this homebrew of yours. Oh, we'll right. do it. So we'll be right back in just a moment. Welcome back to Victory Points. We're here with Vince Casso. Vince, uh, you have mentioned that you really enjoy the games One Night Ultimate Werewolf, which is a social deduction game. Everybody knows sort of some people call it Mafia. Uh, uh, that evolved from the home game into One Night Ultimate Werewolf. Yeah. And then there's games uh, like Secret Hitler, which is a newer version, came out uh, a few years ago, that is also in this genre. Now, I would say, you listed these both in your favorite games. I would say Secret Hitler is a much more complex version of a social deduction game. Why, why do you have both of these in your list when I feel like Secret Hitler is like next level, you know? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what they both bring to the table separately. And so to be clear first that there's these days so many versions of Werewolf. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the version known as One Night Ultimate Werewolf is about a three to four minute long game. It takes place during one night cycle. I have played that, but that's not usually my preferred version. Gotcha. The kind that I play is just called Werewolf. And it can go anywhere from 15 to 30, 40 minutes easy, depending upon the size of the group. And it details the exploits of these werewolves, like Mafia, who attempt to kill off all the villagers across multiple days and nights in this village. There is a DM, or moderator, who tells the story and controls the actions of the various factions. And uh, the villagers, during the day cycles, have an opportunity to locate and kill the werewolves. And during the nighttime, the werewolves can kill the villagers. And it's that sort of interplay of of, uh, roles that is very exciting. Now, the difference between that and Secret Hitler for me is that Secret Hitler, first of all, everyone's playing. There's no moderator. There's no DM, nothing like that. And it's very much a game of attempting to both actively subvert and deceive people at the table, as well as if you're a good person, if you're, you know, one of the non fascists. Uh, <laughs> uh, liberal, is it? I the can't liberals remember. versus is fascists. Liberals? Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, attempting to convince people that you are one of the good guys. Um, so for me, Werewolf brings more of that storytelling mm-hmm. aspect because I improv the shit out of that. <laughs> you like, I, yeah, you like to get in character for that oh, game? Yes. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, First of all, okay. I always DM. 
Yeah. I never play werewolf. I oh. always am the moderator. That's the role that I enjoy. Oh. And oh. so I paint the picture. I tell the story. That's what I love most. And watching everybody just go at each other is hysterical. <laughs> Secret Hitler is I different. See. Because you have to really think and play strategically. Mm -hmm. Because you have a much shorter game comparatively, depending upon the size of the group. But there is a cap with uh, Secret Hitler. Uh, and the actual way it plays, it can be extremely tense and fast-paced because the moment you get those policies down on the board, if you fill up with you know five or however many five uh, fascist policies, game game ends. Yeah. It's over. So it's tense. There's much more tension there. We should explain how Secret Hitler kind of works a little bit. Do you want to try that? Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, um, what you're doing is you're going around. Uh, there's wonderfully crafted wooden blocks that say both Chancellor and the uh, president. President. Yeah, and, yeah, um, yeah. So the president rotates around the circle, and the chancellor is chosen by the president. Mm -hmm. Now, the there's also uh, a small board in the middle, and each time someone new is president, then they will get to enact a policy. And they will choose three policies from a stack face down, and there's a mix of fascist and liberal policies. And you'll... Eliminate one and pass the other two to the chancellor, and the chancellor will choose one of those, and that policy is enacted. Is that done secretly? Uh, mm -hmm. it's yeah. Secretly, yes. Yeah. Only the president and chancellor can see the policies they are Ooh. dealing with. Right, okay, cool. And the objective of the liberal team is to pass five liberal policies or assassinate secret Hitler. I believe after you've passed a certain number of policies, you can assassinate one person. If you pass a certain number of fascist policies, you can earn an assassination, mm. yes. Mm. That's the trick, though. That's part of the fun interplay of the game is that passing liberal policies wins the liberals the game, but passing fascist policies, even though it helps the fascists win, can also give the sitting president a very fun, interesting power. Oh, interesting. To use against right. people. Yeah. Now, the fascist kind team of like actually in has... life. <laughs> right. The fascist team actually has to pass six policies. Right, yeah. But if all you have to do is thwart things, it's a little easier sometimes to do that. Yeah. What's great about this game is you can play with up to 12 people, I think, off the top of my head. 10 people, max, uh, which is great for, as a party game because, you know, yeah. sometimes you're stuck in the conundrum of what do we play with this many people. Um, it is a little slow sometimes if you're waiting for the president to come around to you and no one's picked you as chancellor. Uh, you could feel a little left out because people will fixate on whoever they've got hunches about that's already done something. Yeah. Well, now, there is the occasional, for example, depending upon the policy enacted and how far along you are, you can have it be where the, I believe it's the sitting current sitting president chooses the next president. Oh. So it skips people and can go across the room to someone else. Right. Uh, it, it's just part of all that crazy strategy that gets into play where... There are so many ways for the liberals or the fascists to try and edge each other out and appear that the, like they're a member of the other team. Yes. Now, this is a very fun game. Oh, I enjoy yeah. it quite a bit. Do you feel any moral qualms about being Hitler and trying to pass fascist policies? For me, again, I'm an actor. Sure. So, <laughs> so it's like when you're in the context of playing a game, you commit to whatever side the game gives you. Um, realizing, of course, that fundamentally the game is a very, very harsh critique of that system of government and the way in which those things can come about in reality. And they are very factually molded in, you know, as as much as a game can be, tabletop game can be, uh, uh, along what actually took place in the late 30s in Germany uh, with the whole idea of the president and the chancellor and how power can move like that. Um I appreciate it for the fact that it is a bit of an ideological historical critique, but that also, when you take all that aside, it is just a hidden roles game. It's just, you know, two teams against each other. There doesn't have to be a political aspect involved. You can just look at it as similar to werewolves, where it's, you know, baddies versus goodies, and you're just trying to kill each other. Sure. Actually, what you just described is a term I just learned. Uh, Jeff Kanata was teaching us about the, the well-known idea of the magic circle, and that, that it falls inside that uh, we're all agreeing to abide by these rules for a certain period of time and leave the real world out of it. Yeah. So uh, that's, that's, a, that's a good justification for if anybody feels any moral qualms. It's just stepping into the magic circle. You can be a villain for a time and then let it go. Yeah. And realize that no one's condoning fascism by playing this of game. Of course. <laughs> yeah. And it's fun because, you know, for example, like in life, obviously, I, I try to live life very honestly. I try to be very forthright with people. But in the context of these games, I can 
sit back and see exactly how far I can push people, how much you can manipulate the table to think a certain way. And seeing that interplay of ideas and psychologies against each other and how you can manipulate trust, for example, for the sake of a game with people who are all consenting to be part of that yes. experiment is a very fun thing to do because we're all doing that. We're all, like you said, the magic circle theory. We're all agreeing to be in this little bubble separate from reality for a short period of time where we are realizing we are all out to get each other, but that it's just a game and then you can step out of it and that's it. Yeah, especially social deduction games because they encourage finger pointing, which is something yes. we hate to do in real life, but man, it feels so good to do it in the mm -hmm, game, which is like totally. Becca is clearly a fascist. Yes. Yes. And then my face turns bright red. I hate being the one that's bad because I'm not good at lying about it. Yeah. And then but the, the, the added aspect of nominating another person to a position of power within yeah. the game, that's a brilliant mechanic. The fact that the oh, chancellor yeah. nominates nominates the president is like, okay, people don't suspect me, but I'm going to nominate Vince and people suspect Vince. So then are they going to start suspecting me because I nominated him? Yeah. Or do I look like an idiot? Or like, is it good to look like an idiot right now? It's like, <laughs> I don't know. I love all those layers of it for sure. Absolutely. But then you could do that as a way to know that a fascist policy will get passed, but also then you turn on Vince. How could you? Yeah. Oh, I've thrown so many people under the bus. You have no idea. <laughs> you betray your partner's kind strategy. of thing. Yeah, yeah because oh, yeah. You, then you look like the good guy, the Absolutely. white hat. Sure. It's about subtle telegraphing. It's about knowing body language, knowing social cues, and being able to lay the groundwork ahead of time for you to ultimately betray your fellows. Absolutely. It's a dark game, but it's fun because we're all kind of in that bubble temporarily. Yes. And I'll, I'll t say this right now, and so I know people like this, it is not for everyone. Mm -hmm. There yeah. are certainly people who do not appreciate the even, you know, uh, fake animosity aspect of the game because the game can become contentious, but in a playful way it is a game but you know often when i play secret hitler it ends up with people shouting yeah. over each other and screaming and pointing fingers and arguing but we all know what we're doing we all know that we're playing a game and so that's part passion. of the contest yeah but people who for example are not big on confrontation not big on fighting for a position or on being told they are a liar for example it's not the game for them and that's totally okay it definitely, you have to be okay with that arguing aspect, which I love, but I totally understand someone not. That's another good name for the genre, which is a you're a liar genre. You're <laughs> Pretty a liar much, genre. yeah. That's werewolves, that's the resistance, that's Secret Hitler, yeah, and the those, thing. You yeah. know what? I got to throw one out because uh, it recently got put in a very special place in my house, which is on top of the bookshelf where no one can reach it, <laughs> inside of the divot. And this is a game that I like a lot, but it. Not enough people do. It's called what? Dead Last. I believe you've played it on I Game the Game a long time ago. We have, yeah. Uh, it's a six-player game. Everybody is a color, and then they have a car, and that's on a little standee in front of them, so everybody okay. knows what color you are. And then in your hand is a deck of cards, one for each co person playing their color. And all you do is simultaneously everybody secretly puts a, down a card of who they want to kill. If you think everybody's trying to kill you and played your color card, you put the ambush card down. And this becomes a game of secretly winking, like, let's all kill Vince. You know? Like, Jake. I just motion with Ooh, my head over right. it. I like it. it. And it, uh, it inevitably makes everybody feel upset. Like, why <laughs> didn't you even like wink at me? I would have killed Jake, but you didn't even make an eyes eyes at me. And it's yeah. like, well, I did. You just weren't paying attention. Oh, that's dark. And, yeah. Yeah. We just played it, and it was pretty fun. But um, I said, okay, great. Uh, had a good time, and we're just gonna put this on a special yeah. place on the shelf. <laughs> that's the thing about these social deduction games. There's two layers of them. There's like a there's resistance in Avalon where you're trying to guess what other people yeah. are and win, but then there's the games that murder other people. Yeah, where you're that very actively the subverting game, people. Yeah. Where you're pointing at them and you're like, I want you to leave the I game and die, die because yeah. I don't trust you. And it's like, holy Jesus. <laughs> no more yeah. playing for you. Yeah, that's a whole nother level of those that gets in wonderfully intense. Yeah. But as you said, Vince, it is a thing of you've got to know your audience and know what the players that are there that night can handle. Yeah, and yeah. there are, for example, I'll throw a game night not much lately, but when I do, uh, yeah, I feel you. Yeah, I'll have people over and I'll be like, okay, great. Like, knowing this group, we're going to be playing these three games and not these. Yeah. Yes. Because they're not going to like these yeah. games. I just know it's going to go poorly. Mm -hmm. uh, alternatively, one time I played Dead Last and people just didn't get into it. They're like, 
okay, well, I guess I'll just kill this person. And everybody would have chosen someone else because nobody was playing the subvertive kill. It was like, yeah, let's see like who randomly we all chose. That's oh, the weirdest oh. feeling, isn't it? It's like going to a restaurant where you expect the food to be really good and it's just fine. You're like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm here for the next 45 minutes. I mean, I got my company, which I'm happy about. Yeah. But man, this... But they'd be the perfect team to play a cooperative game with, you know? Yeah. So yeah. Th- different subsets of personality types are so suited to particular types Well, so as a juxtaposition with that, I one of my favorite games in the world is Once Upon a Time. Because when we're talking about, like, comparing <laughs> straight to the computer. we Both of us are like, okay, we got to Google this immediately. Yeah. Uh, which I, I'm constantly surprised by how not as well known that game is, even though it's been out forever. But I adore this game. 1993. Um, yeah, I first played it during That's a charity older stream. Than you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you uh, were two. Come on. Yeah, I was two years old. I'm not even real at that point. Uh, but uh, I first played it for a charity stream years ago for Deacon Sundry, uh, oh. and I fell in love with the game. We it's- have uh, talked about this with another guest on this podcast that listeners probably remember, and I won't say who because I forgot. <laughs> Way to own up to it, though. That's awesome. <laughs> Might have been uh, Lizzie. But it's, you know, as opposed to a rules-based or PvP or what have you kind of game, this is, it's you're still playing against other players, but it's highly cooperative in that the whole game is based on this premise of yes, and you have to tell the story together. <gasps> And you have to make it work together. Mm. Um, and it is totally freeform. You know, there are very basic rules that allow gameplay to continue, but you are making up a story together based on very vague prompt cards that you want to get rid of. You want to empty your hand, essentially. And it's just... You just have to justify it by playing it, essentially, into yeah, the story. Yeah, so for example... The- I remember Rob Manuel just was on this podcast and described this game to me. That's so funny. I it's a wonderful know. game. Yeah. So they're, they're basically, the two ways you can get rid of a card are either while you're telling your story, after sufficient time has elapsed from the last card you played, you can then introduce another plot element. If I have, like, you know, a woman and a forest then I can start by saying, oh, yes, the party was traveling through a forest, and they went through this, did this, did this, did this. They came across a woman living in a cottage. And, and I, she you fell can, in love with a tree. Yeah, and you can just sort of make stuff up. Um, or if someone else is telling a story, their, their version of the story, they're continuing it, and you happen to have a card for the thing they just said happened. <gasps> like if they say, oh, and they found a forest, and you have a forest card, you can say, ah, oh, mine now, and now you take over the story. So Ooh, the, the This thing- is the most Vince game ever. <laughs> <laughs> the thing- for the guy who wants to just... Always be the game master yeah. for werewolf. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. The things that they add in when you go to the forest and then and then and then meet a woman. It's those and thens that you keep an ear out for yeah. as an opponent because to drop cards, in your card. Cards can have characters, locations, That's events. Great. Oh. Like that. So, for example, like an event card might say, like, something found. So if they're like, oh, in the forest, they discover a blank. You're yeah. like, ah, you found uh-huh. something. As soon as they use that verb, you're on it. That's cool. Yeah. That's really great. And oh. so, again, you have to know your group. Because some people both, you know, either are not comfortable with improv storytelling or just don't particularly enjoy it. But if you have a game of people who are, for example, D&D nerds or who just love the idea of collaborative storytelling, they will love this game. And often the stories become just ridiculous, like fits of breathless laughter. And if you have the right group for it, I highly recommend the game. Do you still play the 1993 version of it or is there a newer version of it? I mean, the box I have looks mad old, so (laughs) I don't know. That's the original. I believe there's been many expansions. There are a lot of other decks and expansions, yeah. I don't have those. I have the base game, but that alone is enough to have an amazing time. Great. There's also a little game called Story Cubes. It sounds like it's not. It's the non-competitive version of this. This sounds like a better version of Story Cubes, even though Story Cubes is more recent. Yeah. Story Cubes is dice that you roll that the face has a picture and you create a story around that. Uh, Oh, fun. (laughs) But but this is, I need a little competition in anything I do. I can't play a game that's just the peaceful story. Uh, You know, I, I need to battle some monsters in a dungeon. I love the dynamic that you can score points off of your opponent's story. That's yeah, a great absolutely. idea. Absolutely. Yeah. And you are all telling one story. And that's the beautiful thing is there's this idea that you are against each other but that the story is collaborative and that you have to support the story that's already told mm-hmm. and continue it forward in a way that makes sense. And you have the ability too to call people out if like they just contravene a story point from earlier. If they're not keeping track, you can say, no, no, wait. Uh, her robe was blue. And now the story's mine because you you missed that point. And so everyone has the ability to sort of moderate the tale and ensure that it's being told consistently and being kept 
uh, true to the story. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't just sort of like take it off on your own totally separate direction. Yeah, you direction. need to keep the continuity a Yeah, little we're bit. working together and telling a story even though there's only one winner. Sure. Mm. Oh, I'm really excited to play this game yeah, now that I've now. been told it two times. <laughs> What's fun too is each player at the very beginning is given an ending card. Each player has a different ending to the story they have to get to. Mm. And so once they've burned through all their story cards, their job is to then work the story toward their specific ending, and they can't win until or unless they do. So I've seen people have nothing but their ending card for like 10 minutes straight <laughs> and just never have a chance to get there. It's fun. It's a lot of fun. It's a great game. Can you? How do you steal the story at that point? Only when your ending is... Well, so once you lose the story, you draw another card. So, for example, uh, you'll draw it, and the person, okay, great, now I'm interrupting you, I play my last story card to take the story back, and I have nothing but my ending card, and I'm telling the story, and I'm trying to get us over back to the castle, because my story is castle-based, and so it's this whole, it's Just a whole adventure. Just let it be in a castle! Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. That's great. Yeah, well, it's fun. I would like to talk a little bit about uh, your strategy for... When you're playing in a more competitive, the total opposite of Once Upon a Time kind of game, a player yeah. versus player game, how do you keep that animosity, just leave it when you leave the game? Right, yeah, totally. So we touched a bit on this uh, with Secret Hitler, uh, because that's the game that I've found encourages the most animosity between people. Um, <laughs> and I've definitely, look, I've personally witnessed people walking away from a game of Secret Hitler upset. Yeah. Like, not happy. Mm -hmm. And it just really bummed out uh, and that's when I started learning like oh this is like it's situational this game does not work for everyone because you know there I am with a couple friends who are more tailored to the genre or more you know they're actors what have you they're used to this and we're screaming at we each other we love rejection as yeah. actors <laughs> oh my god sure. uh, we're <laughs> screaming at each other calling each other liars pointing out the flaws in the argument subverting each other throwing each other on the bus um, and loving it. And loving every second. <laughs> but then there's a couple players who are just like, this is too much. Like, they're, yeah. yeah, it's, oh my God, they're not enjoying this at all. Like, it's just, it's hard and it's confrontation and it's dark and painful and very deeply upsetting. Um, and so for me, the, the, the number one thing is, first of all, knowing the players ahead of time. Knowing that there are some games that will just kind of work for everyone. And we've all played those, you know, the family style games, uh, the craniums, the clues, stuff like that, which tend to work for most people because they're approachable. Um, but that if you, number one, don't know the group as well, or specifically know people in the group to be a bit more on the reserved or less confrontational side, this is a, t a genre of game you want to approach gradually. And, you know, you can approach it with The Resistance or Avalon, for example, which is a little bit less intense than Secret Hitler. Mm -hmm. You can approach it with a uh, a briefer version of Werewolf, like One Night Werewolf, because the whole game resolves in about five minutes. There are winners and losers, but it's simple, it's easy, it's yeah, not it's confrontational. Sample. Yeah, sample, sample size. <laughs> but without all the confrontation. Um, and sort of see how they feel. Uh, but beyond that, what it comes down to during the game is also ensuring that you never, and this is so important, it shouldn't have to be said, but it needs to anyway, you never make the gameplay about the people at the table. Mm. Realize that at, during these tabletop games, you are all playing a character, whether you know it or not. If you are playing Secret Hitler, then you are playing a liberal or a fascist, and you are playing that version of yourself who is attempting to win that game in that way. Mm -hmm. You are not playing... Vince Casso saying things Vince Casso thinks all of the time. You have a character and insults, uh, attempts at subversion, uh, you know, calling people, ca being called a liar. These are directed at the character, never the person. It's kind of easy to break the circle, unfortunately. It is, bit. yeah. Right? Well, because I've heard people, for example, I I've seen this in games where people use personal details yes. Ooh, to too. exploit the game. Yikes. Like, Oh, like you're. They like, just tweeted, cheated on their wife, so we should. Oh Jesus! So might, why are we all playing a game Hitler. together right yeah. now? <laughs> <laughs> She's yes. here. I can't believe they're still dude. bringing each other to parties. Right, it's so so um, awkward. But no, you see that where a person's like, you know, oh, like you're so full of shit because every time you lie, you do this kind of thing. Yeah. Or here's how I know you're crap because earlier you said this, <laughs> and I'm like, that's not in the game. No. You said that's you were gonna do the, the dishes. Game. How do I know you're gonna make this policy oh, happen? Oh my god! Right? Oh, that's how you get them to do the dishes. Um, <laughs> Also, a piece of advice I'd like to add. We were talking about how it escalates in a fun way if you're into that with finger pointing and whatnot. Never, 
actually physically point a finger because that gesture <laughs> yeah. feels very uh, affrontery. You know, it, it feels very attacking to yeah. point at someone. Uh, sure. it, it, it's like, okay, it get is. your it's, finger out of my face. That's, um, that's nature, isn't it? Just a little it? piece of advice. Yeah, that's Same with a very like eye natural contact response. in an aggressive way, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Not even to dig too deep into it, but that's definitely something that I've had to consider in terms of how certain body language, even though we all know why we're there, we all know what we're doing, certain types of body language feel more personal than is necessary. And so for me, like, if I'm indicating to someone, I'm usually more careful to be like, you know, the open hand palm up, like kind of thing like that. Like yeah. this person's doing oh. this. Like that kind of a thing where it's more like, again, it's a gentler suggestion, yes. gentler indication to someone than going like this. You know, yeah. I've, ooh, ooh, I hated it. I've yeah. seen you do that and I didn't realize how conscious you were of it. And it's so great <laughs> to know that now because when you do it now, I also see your frustration. So when we, you guys obviously can't see it, but he's reaching his his arms palms out, up. palms up towards a person. But he's, his fingers are very like rigid. Yes. So you can see the tension in his arms, which is but, the frustration of trying yeah. to convince but people. palms up is a psychological it's it um it means that you're not hiding anything so yeah. i wonder if players who just naturally keep their hands under the table or palms facing themselves naturally in this sort of game get accused more often even when they're not <laughs> guilty be. because they're just not showing their palms so another useful practical tip for players on this type of genre yeah when i'm palms up when I'm wearing a vest playing these games, I kind of open it up and I go, you can trust me. <laughs> <laughs> Roll up the sleeves. Yeah. But yeah it's All like, the magician's tricks. Also for me, part of the focus is in terms of the way that you are projecting that energy, which is tension, frustration, accusation, whatever it is. The more that you can internalize the energy and make it more about yourself than about that person mm. is also typically helpful for them in that. If I'm if I have this frustration and anger and I'm just making all of it your problem, things you're doing, no things you're about, as opposed to like a this is what I'm feeling, here's what I've noticed, here's oh. why I think we should do this certain thing, or why that person might not be trustworthy. I trust you when you do the palms it's, thing. <laughs> it does. But it's more internally focused. It's not like Look at how much of a mess this person is, and more like understand. Well, that's a whole different issue. <laughs> but it's less about like look at their flaws, and more about understand my point my of perspective. view. Yes. Yeah, 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 sure, sure. Oh, I love that. I love that. Practical tips. Now we're almost out of time here, but I did want to touch on how you think playing this sort of game has made you a better person to be around and a better gamer, and what you've learned, what the takeaway is there. Yeah. Well, this is true for tabletop gaming. This is true for D&D &D and, and RPGs especially as well. But one thing that I think all of these types of games really convey is a, a certain degree of, I mean, I guess if you're taking lessons away, and I hope people are because there's a lot to be learned from these types of games, is how to proactively collaborate with people, how to listen to other people's ideas and treat them as valid and realize that it's not all about you. Uh, <laughs> this is... <laughs> yeah. This is also more true for uh, RPGs because RPGs, you have to realize it's not the Kalen Belfew show. Mm -hmm. It's not, you know. Even though his RP is perfect. It's flawless. Well, it's. It, I actually break the fourth wall a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you do. But like you also, not to interrupt you too much, but yeah. I just want to say like it's not the Kalen Belfew show, but I am most cognizant of your storyline in relation to things that happened in that campaign because you fleshed it out the most. Yeah. So you have the the heaviest anchor in that world, too. So as much For as sure, not yeah. your show, I'm always conscious of how this relates to your backstory, which is not always true of the other players. I right. do that for them less frequently, but for you, it's kind of always there. Yeah, I put work into that. Yeah, well, that, but that's a sign of your own writing. That's a, yeah. how it contributes. We'll yeah. bring the DM to you instead of you <laughs> pushing so hard to get in front of the DM. There you yeah. go. But yeah, like that's what it comes down to is even these games that are PvP focused or are about that, you know, um, subterfuge, that hidden role aspect, what have you, you learn how to tell a story together and you learn how you can sort of elevate a situation to live in that magic bubble and put on this show but also to diffuse and to present those controversial ideas in a way that is not completely unacceptable to another person. Because that's also part of life. You have to be able to have hard conversations. You have to be able to get in someone's face if necessary, but not push things over the edge. You can be intense. You can be strong-willed and of strong perspective, but not in a way that completely ruins whatever point you're trying to make because you cannot be received by that person. Mm -hmm. And those contentious games help to impart that. How to convince a group, hey, hard conversation, this sucks, but this person's a fascist. 
<laughs> I feel like you grow from it too afterwards. Like yeah. you, we shared that experience together where we killed Becca because she was a fascist, but then we walked out. Of the- <laughs> <laughs> but even with like Becca, like we even increased our relationship with Becca a little bit because we kind of got a read on okay, her or whatever. You know yeah. I'm a fascist. <laughs> you knew me. You got me. It's but, your boy Hitler. But we shared that experience and then we took away from that yeah. a little bit. We connected for a brief moment, even yeah, if not for in the sure. real world. Well, Vince, it's been such a pleasure to have you on Victory Points. It's been a pleasure to be on Victory Points. I seriously want to. I know people wanna... can find you on Twitter at Vince Casso. Yes, Twitter and Instagram at Vince Casso. Anything else you want to shout out? Yeah, I mean, check out LA by Night on Geek and Sundry, uh, twitch.tv slash Geek and Sundry every Friday night at probably 8 p.m. PST. <laughs> That's correct. <laughs> We figured it out. And when uh, We're Alive Frontier starts rolling out, check out that show, too, directed yeah. by the illustrious Jake Michaels. Ooh. Absolutely. Uh, coming back to Twitch soon. Like, ASM hard into the microphone. Mm. Uh, coming ASM soon. ASM yeah. hard. <laughs> Ooh. Mm. You and did it because you did it real good. Thank you. <laughs> and, yeah, those things uh, are things that I'm doing right now. I mean, there's a lot of projects in the works right now. Um, I've got a, uh, I shot a pilot for a sitcom up in Guelph, Canada in February, which is currently being negotiated for distribution. Ooh. Um, Fingers crossed. Yeah, right. Uh, I've got a film coming out hopefully pretty soon. Uh, it's currently in talks for distribution with Fox. Um, and then myself, I've written five TV pilots. I'm currently working on pitching and developing, and then I'm working, starting in on two screenplays as well. So hopefully before long, you'll be seeing more of my own work out in the media world as yeah. well. And I don't you- know how you found the time while writing a four-inch thick <laughs> pile of d D or, or uh, role playing world, um, but very All right, impressive. Very, quickly. very impressive. <laughs> I do want to have you back one year from now to talk about that campaign too. Let's do it. Put it in the book. <laughs> See where it goes. I Excellent. think I'm free that week. Okay. Jake, final thoughts. Uh, Vince is great. I'm glad we had him. You're Me great. Yeah. You guys are both great. <laughs> Stop it. Well, and our audience is great. Thank you for listening to the entire episode. You made it all the way to the end. Good Woo. job. Unless you skipped to right now, <laughs> in, in which, which case, case, you don't why? get credit for that. Don't you're, do that. You're don't. an interesting individual. Good for you. Yeah. <laughs> That's your thing. <laughs> that, was, that was a unique choice you made there. I always listen to the last two minutes of a podcast. <laughs> Absolutely. Read the last page of a book first. I get there it. You go. Anyway, please subscribe, rate this show. That's always helpful. Tell your friends about it and share it on social media. And we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.